Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We have come together in the name of Jesus the Christ. To worship the God who loves us and sing with the Spirit who fills us. It is good that we are here. It is, it is good, good that, that we are here by Christ's invitation, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who has, who has blessed us with every good and perfect gift. Great is the gift of planet Earth, spinning around the light and the warmth of the sun, filled with immeasurable wealth and beauty. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who has blessed us with every good and perfect gift. And great is the gift of the seasons, summer and winter, spring and autumn, seed time and harvest. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who has blessed us with every good and perfect gift. Great is the gift of all living creatures that crawl inside, swim and dive, walk and leap, climb and soar into the skies. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who has blessed us with every good and perfect gift. Great is the gift of human life, with the diversity of races, cultures and gifts, and each person with a distinctive fingerprint and soul. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who, who has, has blessed, blessed us with, with every good and perfect gift. Great is the gift of our human yet divine brother, Jesus of Nazareth. Great is the quality of his loving, the power of his teaching, the glory of his sacrificial death, the energy of his resurrection, and the outpouring of the Spirit in his name. Wonderful is God, our Creator and Redeemer, who, who has blessed us with every good and perfect gift. Of 
his glory reaching down, and with humble hearts we'll turn towards him, bow before him, oh the Lord our God is great, our God is King. Greetings friends, my name is Gary Divinar and I'm one of the society stewards serving the Hilton Methodist Church. I just want to draw your attention to the bulletin for this week. As we continue through this time of isolation, as we work through the whole COVID-19 situation, uh, I just encourage you to stay connected in, in whatever way possible, whether it's through WhatsApp or just a simple telephone call, but just to to share support and encouragement and love with, with those around you and those that you connected with. And just to remind you of our mission statement, everyone alive in Christ, serving him with heart, head and hands. And in the bulletin, uh, Paul has shared a letter. It's a letter of encouragement and support as well as a reflection during these times. And I really uh, encourage you to to get hold of that letter in the bulletin and just spend some time reading through it and just reflecting in your own situation. If you are in particular need of help there, you'll see in the bulletin there's there's a bunch of um, support groups and lifelines where uh, you can certainly seek that support. So yeah, feel free to use those resources in, in your own situation. And from the kids' corner, 
just to say that um, the children's stories continue uh, thanks to the support from Michelle. And if you'd like to be part of those stories, if you could just contact Michelle um, and she will give you the various links to the godly play stories. The Junior Youth Zoom program um, that has been running is currently in remission until the end of July. So just to note there, there are a number of birthdays in the coming week. And we really wish those people that, that are celebrating their birthdays, there are a number. Um, so I just suggest that you you have a look at the, the bulletin and you know, contact those various people on their day and, and wish them. And lastly, we just continue to to pray for all those that have speci- uh, special needs um, and prayer requests. And in particular, we have uh, little Theo and the Serfontaine family. Dawn Sarrell and Doreen Kruger, Megan Tatz, Luyanda and Benz, Maura and George Payne, Teresa Nadu, the Worstazen family, my father and my cousin, Rick Madison, Margaret Matthews and Boshoff's mom, and then uh, and also Ross Dunbar's father. And then just friends, we just want to extend our sincere condolences out to Irene and Clive Rodder and their family and Pauline in particular. Unfortunately, uh, Matt um, passed away earlier this this morning and or this is Saturday morning on the recording. Um, and we really are, yeah, thinking of the the Rodder family and we really extend our, our prayer support out to them. And may God just comfort them and be with them during this this difficult time. So yeah, on that note, um, yeah, we just. Pray that you and wish you all the best for the week coming and yeah, hope to connect in the near future. Otherwise, take care and God bless. Loving Heavenly Father, you created all things, everything in perfect balance and in harmony. From the moment we entered this world, we have caused ongoing destruction of our beautiful and diverse planet. Our very sin and greed has resulted in the devastation of this land that you created. Hear our prayers, O Lord, to heal the brokenness done to our environment. We pray for our authorities who are responsible for the protection and regulation of our environment. Grant them wisdom and integrity to maintain the well-being and sustainable use of land from the mountains to the rivers to the ocean. We pray for our farmers who work the soils to produce crops that feed the many people living in this incredible land. Give them knowledge to farm wisely and protect them from the devastation of diseases and climatic turmoil. We pray for our miners who go about extracting valuable resources from the very core of our land. May they do this responsibly and sustainably with minimal destruction. We pray for our industries producing all sorts of goods often at a cost to the environment, as well as the constantly expanding developments that continue to constrict our natural open spaces that are critical to the support of ecosystems. May you soften the hearts of those who look for gains at the expense of others and the environment. Lastly, we pray for ourselves as citizens of this earth. May we be filled with a passion and purpose to act as ambassadors for the environment Help us to notice the true beauty that surrounds us each day. Unite us as the people of this land, that we may work together to repair the damages in our environment, to help clean our life-giving rivers, and to enable the world around us to blossom. Pour out your, your power and love that we may protect life and all its beauty, so that our children and all future generations will be able to experience your creation in the fullness of your glory. Hear our prayers, O Lord. For this we pray in the beautiful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.
reading is taken from Matthew 11 verse 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. Now, to what can I compare people of this day? They are like children sitting in a marketplace. One group shouts to the other, we played wedding music for you, but you wouldn't dance. We sang funeral songs, but you wouldn't cry. When John came, he fasted and drank no wine, and everyone said, he has a demon in him. When the Son of Man came, he ate and drank, and everyone said, Look at this man, he's a glutton and a drinker, a friend of tax collectors and other outcasts. God's wisdom, however, is shown to be true by its results. At that time, Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you, because you have shown to the unlearned what you have hidden from the wise and learned. Yes, Father. This was how you wanted it to happen. My Father has given me all things. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you, and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit. And you will find rest, for the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. Here ends the reading. So this is a tough time. People are struggling in many ways, so many ways, physically, emotionally, financially. Christians are struggling in so many ways, physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. And so we ask where is God? How do we understand the challenges of this period? When will this end? This has been a confusing time for many Christians because just maybe we battle to trust God through all of this. Whenever we face challenges in life, whenever our circumstances seem to pull the ground from under our feet, whenever the things that we place our security in are under threat, the natural reaction is to ask where God is in all of this. It may feel like God has forgotten us. In the words of David in Psalm 13 verse 1, we may be asking, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? Now, Scripture tells us that God is working His purposes in our lives. Scripture tells us that we need to be faithful and trust that God is in control. But sometimes we struggle with the mystery. We want to be in control. We want to know what's happening. We are not easily reassured by promises that things will work out for the best. This is the difficulty with faith. As the gospel singer Michael Card puts it in one of his songs, to hear with my heart, to see with my soul, to be guided by a hand I cannot hold, to trust in a way that I cannot see, that's what faith must be. 
Our human minds can't understand all the ways of God. We can't capture who God is in slick little slogans. The great African theologian Augustine of Hippo put it like this, if you think that you've grasped God, it is not God you have grasped. If you can get your mind around it, it isn't God. It's something else that you might incorrectly think is God, but in fact is something you have created and invented and labeled as God. That's why at some point we need to humbly acknowledge that we don't understand, but we trust God. We believe that God is for us, even if we can't always see this in our circumstances, because that's what faith must be. The wonderful truth is that we can relate to God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. This is indeed wonderful. As it has been said, Jesus is God with skin on. Even as we acknowledge this, though, we do need to recognize that Jesus would not fit any more neatly into our society today than he did back then. If he were among us in the flesh, he would be just as outspoken on injustice, on corruption, on abuse, as he was then. If he were among us, he would be difficult to handle. He would be associated with people we probably wouldn't associate with. He would be breaking our social conventions and traditions. He would be blazing truth that would challenge all our pretenses and sin and self-justifications. The description of Aslan, the lion who represents Christ in C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories would be very apt. He's not a tame lion. Neither is Jesus tame. But surely, though, he would feel at home in our churches, amongst those who call themselves his followers. Surely he wouldn't be as harsh on us as he was on the Pharisees. No, I wonder about that. I think he might just have something to say about how we've watered down his teaching, how we've taken to reinterpreting his words or the words of the scriptures, which he said would never pass away. I think he might just wonder about how we've become embarrassed by his truth, you know, just 2,000 years ago or how we have tried to adapt his truth to suit our lives, to not break into our comfort zones. As Jesus himself points out in the first part of today's reading, in verses 16 to 19, the people who saw Jesus criticized him and rejected him because he didn't fit their expectations. Neither did John the Baptist. He didn't eat what they ate or drink what they drank. And so they said he had a demon. Jesus came and got alongside people even the hated and rejected people of that day, and ate with them and drank with them, and they called him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of sinners. <laughs> would we do better? I hope so. But one thing is for sure, Jesus would be a challenge to each and every one of us, because we'd all prefer, you know, that he was like us. <laughs> but our faith is more than just a set of beliefs. Yes, Jesus came to fulfill scripture, and yes, all scripture is God-breathed and entirely able to thoroughly equip us for every good work, as it says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. Yes, despite the, the way in which the religious authorities of his day used it as a means of condemnation, Jesus completely affirmed all scripture. Ultimately, all scripture, after all, testifies to him. But Jesus would not be satisfied with the amount of knowledge we have. No, it's not how much of God's truth we have in our heads that counts, but rather how much of God's truth is in our lives. There's an image that may help us here. The theologian John McKay drew a distinction between the balcony and the road. I'm talking to you from a balcony, as you can see. Having studied Spanish in Madrid so that he could work as a missionary in Peru, McKay was struck by how Spanish families would gather on the balconies of their houses, overlooking the street so that they could watch the hustle and bustle down below. McKay distinguishes between living your life on the balcony, where you can be detached and uninvolved from real life, um, and the position when you are actually on the road, when you are in the midst of real life, where choices are made and decisions are carried out. Now the nice part about being on the balcony is that you can get an overview of all that's going on. But McKay points out that Christian discipleship is lived out on the road, in relationship with others, working out where we need to go and the best way to get there. Now you may well say at this point, I understand the image, 
but actually the stress of the road is exactly what I want to escape from at this point in my life. And in any event, who wants to be on the road in a time of pandemic? Surely a little social distancing on the balcony would be a much better idea. This is where Jesus' teaching in the rest of this passage is really, really helpful for us. It starts in verse 25, where Jesus praises God the Father because he has hidden um, his ways from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. So my immediate reaction, of course, as a professor must then be to say, stop studying, stop accumulating knowledge. No, God has no problem with learning and studying. He delights in us exploring all aspects of the created order that he's made. Yes, from my own perspective, even law. What is being referred to in this verse is, as Eugene Peterson describes them in the message rendering, is sophisticates and know-it-alls. You know, the supposedly self-righteous and clever. James Denny once said, no man can bear witness to Christ and, um, and to himself at the same time. No man can give the impression that he is clever and that Christ is mighty to save. Now, I think that's a particular warning to us preachers, of course, but it has general application. God hasn't really hidden the truth of his ways from anyone. But if you're seeking to put yourself forward as clever, to draw attention to yourself, then you're not in a position to accept God's truth about himself. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27 that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. On the other hand, Jesus says, God has revealed himself to little children, to the humble, the unassuming. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 3, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not that God is opposed to wisdom or that Jesus is thrilled that the wise and the learned are being excluded. After all, as Dallas Willard rightly and helpfully points out, Jesus was the cleverest, the wisest person that ever lived. I want to be wise. Having done a host of foolish things in my life, I especially want to be wise. How can I be wise? Well, in Proverbs 1 verse 7, Solomon, who was given an especially large amount of wisdom by God, says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, fear is not about being terrified, okay? Um, but it is about knowing that God is God uh, and that we are not. And so we approach God with reverent fear and in all humility. This is what the little children, the ordinary people know. And it's to God's good pleasure, we read in verse 26, that this is the way that it is. God loves the idea that those who come to him come in faith and humility, come with reverence and trust and love. And then Jesus helps us to understand a bit better how it is that he's really one with God the Father in verse 27. He says, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So when we look at Jesus, it helps us to understand the nature of God. Understanding God as much as we can is the most important thing we can do with our lives. The tragedy is that there are so many wrong ideas about God that so many people believe. And this is not so surprising when we remember that God's enemy and ours, Satan, is the father of lies. Some of the most damaging lies we find ourselves believing are lies about who we are and who God is. One of the worst ideas, one of the worst lies about God is that, that he somehow enjoys human suffering. Another is that God doesn't love us. This is why Jesus says, forget everything you know about the nature of God and lose yourself in the picture of God the Father that I will show you. How do you do that? Come to me, says Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. If you've lost your perspective, if you can't see the beauty all around you, come to me. If you're on the verge of burnout, you've been trying so hard, but all that it has done is left you empty and exhausted, depressed, come to me. If you've been hurt, if your trust in others has been rewarded with betrayal or disappointment, come to me. Come to me. What an incredibly gentle invitation. Not as the law would say, go. Do this or do that. Watch your step. Break the commandments and you will die. 
Keep them and you live. The law shows us the distance between God and us. The gospel bridges that awful divide and brings the sinner across it. Jesus calls to us as a parent would do to a little child and calls us to follow him all through life. Imagine for a moment you're in a school classroom. Your teacher is talking to you about achievement in sport at the highest level. You put up your hand and you ask, what would it feel like? What would someone do to handle the pressure at that level? The teacher responds as best she can. And then suddenly, in walks Sia Khaleesi, the World Cup winning South African rugby captain. Now ask your questions, says the teacher. And Sia answers each and every one of them with certainty and conviction. He's been there. He's done that. It's the same with Jesus. He taught with great authority, as it says in Matthew 7, verse 29, because he knows. He knows what it's like to be with God the Father. He knows what it's like to be involved in all of creation. He knows what it's like to have authority over all things. And this same Jesus, the Son of God, calls to you and me, come to me, I will give you rest. I know how to do this. You will find rest for your souls. I've created you. I know how you tick. I know you into the very depths of your being, better than you know yourself. Come to me. I will give you what you need. In this age of confusion, of challenge, of information overload, in this time when you're seeking for answers, I can help, says Jesus. I have the answers. Let me teach you how to handle your money, your marriage, and your mood swings. Let me show you the right way to live here on earth. And then let me welcome you into the very presence of the living God when you die. I can help. I have the answers you need. I can bring you peace, perfect peace, says Jesus, in the midst of all the confusion and challenges of life. You see, Jesus had no fear of failure. This is because he knew that he'd be able to do whatever God had prepared for him to do. He had no fear that he would lack anything because he knew God would provide for him. Jesus didn't need a backup plan. He knew that the God whose faithfulness never fails would always come through for him. He knew his father. And he calls to us, come to me, because what he wants is for each and every one of us to discover his will for our lives, to unlock and develop the gifts that he has given us, for us to draw daily on his power and not to live in stress. Jesus wants each of our lives to be a miracle, a miracle of transformation. For any of us that have tried, especially those of us who have been trying for a long time, we know that we simply cannot change in the power of our own willpower. But in relationship with Jesus, we can change. The ultimate miracle of experiencing Jesus Christ is the ongoing spiritual formation of a person growing in intimate relationship with him becoming more Christ-like in the rough and tumble of everyday life. As we change more and more and more, we learn to walk in the power of His Spirit through this life, walking in His steps. Come to me, calls Jesus. But what is He calling us to? Verses 29 and 30 say, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, there's a legend that Jesus, who, as we remember, was a carpenter, made the best yokes in Nazareth. Maybe this is why he used this image. In any event, it is an interesting picture to hold in our minds. Two oxen pulling a cart or a plow, one a veteran and one a youngster. A wooden yoke is fastened over both their necks, and that links them from side to, to be side by side. The young ox paired with a veteran, learns to pull by imitating the other ox. Indeed, its only choice is, uh, in order to be comfortable is to keep in step with its older partner. This is what Jesus invites us to, a lifelong partnership where we model Christ, even as Christ models us. If we respond to his invitation to come, we learn to live in Christ, to follow him, and to fulfill his example, side by side with him. It's an awesome image, but it's very helpful for us to understand. And as we join this partnership with Jesus our Lord, we find rest for our souls. 
we understand that all the things that seem so important in this life have to be understood in the light of our glorious Savior. He is the sum total of everything. Everything is His. It comes from Him and returns to Him. And we are His. There's never a moment, awake or asleep, when He's not watching over His creation. Why should we spend our days in worry and stress? And we can cast our minds back to the image of the balcony and the road at this point and remember the fact that um, it's easier to be on the balcony, of course, but that what we're called to is to live our lives out, our faith out on the road. We can't ever get rid of the worry and the, the things that cause worry and stress in our lives. But we can know as we walk on the road, even if the road becomes crowded, even if the road becomes a road that we, we, we've never, it's unfamiliar, we've never seen it before, what we know is that Christ goes with us as our guide and our constant companion, and he can keep us in perfect peace. So Oswald Chambers says that the, there are only a few, remarkably few, questions which go to the heart of this life, and they are all answered by these words, come to me. Jesus never stops calling us into that completely safe place in his presence. When we look away, when we try to go our own way, we start to disintegrate. But as we come back to him, as we take on his yoke, we find peace and completeness, for it's his yoke, and he will carry it with us as we go through all of this life. Come to me, Jesus calls, until one day we will hear the words when he calls us to be with him in our eternal home. When he calls again, come you, who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world, as it says in Matthew 25 and verse 34. So the final question is, how will you respond to Jesus' call? How will you respond to Jesus' call? He's calling, come to me. Will you? Amen. Now with the help of my wonderful family, we prepared a response song that expresses the joy of being in a relationship with Jesus. So I hope it will bless you, listen to the words, and, and give, may these words give you strength in the midst of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Just to say at this point that putting all of this together has really uh, helped us appreciate the difficulties and uh, the, uh, um, all that it takes for Paul and Helen to put things together every week. So I really want to just um, honor them and, just, uh, and say that we really appreciate them doing all of that week after week. So, but let's close in a pr with a prayer from St. Ignatius of Loyola. Let's pray together. Oh Christ Jesus. When all is darkness and we feel our weakness and helplessness, give us the sense of your presence, your love and your strength. Help us to have perfect trust in your protecting love and strengthening power so that nothing may frighten or worry us. For living close to you, we shall see your hand, your purpose, your will through all things. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may, may God, God hold you in the palm of his hand.